I'm Amy Calvin. Please welcome Noah Baumbach. Is this the largest film you've ever made in terms of not only the scale of the narrative, but the scale of the performances? The performances are so large. And what was that like? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I didn't... I, I approached it the way I approach all of them, really. I think the story and the writing of it was became broader because of the ideas I had and the things I wanted to put in it. And I think um, I, I, one of my principal things that I wanted to do in a movie was do something in a hospital that I felt also, sh something I felt I hadn't really seen in a movie before was sort of how a certain aspect of what it's like to be in a hospital, how you are at such a vulnerable time in your life and at the same time you, uh, you know, you put so much on these people around you, you want to believe that, you know, that's the best nurse that, you know. And so I didn't know what, how that was gonna come into the movie. I think when I found the structure of it and I broke it up into this sort of various stories in my head of Danny and Matthew and separating the brothers and not having them come into the movie later, that all kind of, uh, in some ways I kind of, I, I suppose, backed into a scope that that maybe you're referring to. Yeah, I didn't mean broad, I meant large, which it's different. Um, well, I don't know, I can't really speak to large, I guess. Okay, <laughs> well, um, the other, I mean, there are so many people out here and they love this movie and they laughed continuously if you weren't here. Uh, so I know people have questions, uh, but I just wanted to ask one more thing. And that has to do with, uh, I've, always, I've felt that your movies really changed with Francis Ha and then Mistress America in that they became movies that were more about women than men and more about characters that you were not angry with. And it seems to me this film, in the way that humor and anger are inseparable. That's what seems to be, you know, just spilling out of this film, and that's why people are so responsive. I mean, it's like everyone's return of the repressed. Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, I, something that Mike Nichols said to me when I first met him after he saw Squid and the Whale, and he said it reminded me why I got into movies to begin with, which was revenge, <laughs> um, which is one of the million great things Mike said about everything. Um, uh, you know, and I think you know, I, 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 it's true in, in, in all my movies that sort of they're different maybe kind of emotional states that fuel things. I think with this one, sure, there's anger in it, but I also think, um, you know, there was love. I wanted to, to, you know, I felt it was a hopeful story um, and, you know, in some ways about how family can kind of define things for, for you know, or parents define things for children and you define, you create, a kind of rule book and a kind of level of what, you know, hierarchy of what's important, what's not. I always felt with this family in a way like art took the place of, of religion and, and that there's a kind of, as, as Ben's character says, you know, we were brainwashed. There is a kind of deprogramming <laughs> that goes on uh, for adults and, and I kind of wanted to, you know, create a, you know, a, a, an interesting story that, that, uh, that, that would maybe bear that out. Um, is there a mic going around? Yes. Uh, so questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, speaking as someone whose uh, mother is recently hospitalized and my family dynamics that you portrayed, I thought, were uncanny and uncannily uh, accurate. So it was really delightful to see that on the screen. Thank you. And to see it infused with uh, humor was, was helpful, too. 
on a personal level. Uh, my question is, will there be a soundtrack available? <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, there will. Um, I mean, Randy Newman, which was a great experience. I mean, if you, you get to work with Dustin Hoffman and Randy Newman in a lifetime, let alone one movie, it's an, it was a, I mean, you know, just knock your socks off kind of experience. And, um, and when we first met, Randy and I um, had breakfast and, and we kind of had a sort of mutual uh, conversation with the mutual understanding that, you know, you really don't know till you see the movie. We can talk about kind of what we think. He said, I think maybe piano because Danny plays piano in terms of the kind of score, but you know, we won't know, he kept saying, until you, know, you start sending me stuff. And, and then the next day he sent me what is the main theme in the movie, so he knew. And, um, uh, and it, most of it is him playing live to the movie. I mean, we did, there's almost no edits in it, so once we came up with the theme, he would play live, and I, I felt that was an important element to have this other it's almost like a narrator in some way, but it's like, you know, to have this other personality, you know, this, this, this hands on keys that were also accompanying the movie. I don't know, it felt like the Super 16 to me. It felt like the movie. And, and, and when that person's Randy Newman, it's a special thing. So, um, but yes, there will be a soundtrack. And thank you for saying what you said before. It's a it's a great movie, Noah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just and I think that this gentleman who talked about someone being in the hospital, I think probably everyone in this room has been through that. So it's it's very affecting. Um, first, did Randy Newman write the Byron Myron song? Randy wrote it with us. We we uh, Adam and I wrote that song, um, and then uh, Randy wrote the music. That's a hit single. <laughs> um, can you talk about the casting? Because the casting is great, and I love the fact that each person who came in, whether it was Candace Bergen or any of them, that you gave them each, a, it wasn't a throwaway, each person had their own distinct scene and told a little story about themselves. And uh, Rebecca Miller was terrific as Loretta. Um, and you really got to know everybody, Judd Hirsch, and you thought that LJ was gonna be a terrible guy, but he turned out to be a friend. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how you cast each person? Yeah, and, and, and to your point, I think, you know, it, 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 if you're casting somebody that, you know, the audience is going to recognize and, and it has, you know, a, a feeling for, and, you know, I feel like it, it needs to be that, you know, you don't want to have them just there because they're fancy, you know, it's, it's, um, um, and it was a great, I, I really, um, I love this cast. I mean, I really felt very close to them and, um, uh, ben and Adam, I had uh, I had met with. It was uh, I, you know I've worked with Ben obviously before, but I, I um, Adam had called me a few years ago and said like if you ever have anything, which usually in my experience when actors do that, then I'll offer them something a few years later and they'll say sorry I just didn't respond to the material. <laughs> so I was girding for that, but I uh, um, I had this I had an idea. I mean we sat down the three of us had lunch together and talked about them playing brothers and the I had wanted to do something about brothers it was I it kind of went back to Squid and the Whale where I had started that movie writing from a, an adult perspective and then scrapped it to go back and write it from the the child's perspective and um Really, the only thing we came away with was was um, that they should fight, that there should be a physical fight. That's all we had. So I reverse engineered the movie from that. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, but it, they were it was just I, you know I, 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 I really loved it. It made it you know very it made it fun in a way to be able, in all cases, to, you could just do more. You could always just explore more. You could press down on the scenes more. Um, I mean, Dustin is ferocious and loves going over everything and talking about it, and, 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 and I love that too. And I, um, you know, I'm really grateful for what he gave me. I can't, I can't um, imagine many of his contemporaries doing and committing to what he had to do in this movie, it's just, you know, it's, it's not, it was, it's not easy for anybody, you know, and he did these long takes and 
scenes go on and on and um, and you know to also be so uncompromising with the portraiture um, but the same was true I mean I was just it's, it's such a great thing to be able to write Candace Bergen and say would you come do this and have her come and have her just do that monologue and just be so moving I mean you know I I cry a lot more in my life now so maybe just just anyway but you know I when when she the first take she did I just started to cry but I, I um uh, and Judd you know you know same thing so it, yeah it was a remarkable group of people As a psychologist, I find it remarkable, the tension between the loss, the anger, the resentment, and still the need to love and to be connected. And, and that is really very difficult to portray, so thank you. Thank you for saying that. Hi. Um, I think a real trademark of most of your films is a real richness of character, and especially in this movie, every character seems very fully formed and they have their own idiosyncrasies. And so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your process of actually creating these characters on the page, Do you, uh, and does the character come before the, the story or vice versa? It's, it varies. I, I, um more in the past, I would say that character dictated w what the story became. I think um, to, to what your comment before, I mean, I think on Francis, I started feeling more comfortable letting structure kind of help me understand the character. I mean, in this movie, in that movie, it was because she kept switching locations, so it, it was also like the homelessness of it that 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 informed a lot of who that person was um, and vice versa. And in this movie, it really was thinking of that sort of compartmentalization of family and this idea of half siblings, you know, and, and you know, which is both could be totally meaningful and totally meaningless and, and different families and who got what and, 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 you know, and I think also spoke a lot to Harold. I think Harold, probably gains a lot by keeping them apart. It's like, you know, if, if they ever got together and talked, you know, they'd overthrow, um, which kind of happens. And so um, uh, that helped a lot to kind of inform who these people were, you know, and, and the idea of Matthew's character being spoken about in the first story and then, you know, and then before you see him also said a lot of, you know, you already kind of know that guy before you even meet Ben. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that you know, I, I think for me anyway, in this movie, that, that, that really helped me kind of figure out who these people were. Don't you? I, I love the scenes with food. Uh, I, I was hoping there would be Maureen's cookbook published. Could you, could you talk a little bit about... They, sh they should do that as a promotional. They should. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you came up with the recipes? Yeah, that's a good question. It's always a pain in the ass shooting food, too. So, you, you know, and there was a lot of discussion, you know, about the shark because there was... I wanted it to be horrible but not too horrible you know and then it's like is it reading horrible enough you know and you kind of um you know and then it always takes longer than you want it to doing a close-up of a, of a of a plate you know with food and you know telling you know grace now go for the go for the clam bring it up bring it up okay bring it down um so a lot of it becomes technical in that way um uh and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, Emma probably knows the ingredients better than I do. <laughs> I want to ask one question. It's an odd question, maybe. Um, did you ever think what would make any of these women want to be involved <laughs> with these terrible men? <laughs> did that ever occur to you? Well, when you say terrible men, what do you mean? Um, well, I mean... That certainly Harold, but the sons would have set me running, and yet they've been married multiple times, all of them. 
So did you ever think what would be the attraction of them? Well, my experience, everybody kind of finds somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, to the degree that you, you see, you know, I understand Emma and Dustin's relationship. Um, uh, you know, and, and from what we hear, Danny and Matthew aren't doing so great in their marriages. Um, uh, no, I, I, yeah, but someone, and sometimes multiple someone said yes at some point. Were they different when they, I'm just asking, was this part of the writing process that you had to think of who they all were when they were younger and? Yeah, I guess, but I didn't think of their desirableness necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, it's also partly why you cast Dustin Hoffman to play Harold. I mean, Dustin makes anybody attractive. I mean, I think, you know, and, and understandable. And, and, you know, that's partly casting, too, is to, to um, you know, I mean, these are all um, incredibly, you know, winning, you know, these are some of the best, you know, people we have in movies, and, and so that helps me do my job a little bit. But I also don't think of them as maybe as negatively as you do. I, I, um, I, I love them all, including Harold, and I, I understand, you know, why, you know, people might fall into a marriage with one or two of them for a few years before they got to their senses, you know. <laughs> I don't think of them as negatively, I just think of them as dangerous. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, the film is, is really great in this, I mean, it, it has a very uh, open and, and shut nature, this uh, very like cohesive feeling, but you also decided to include chapters on this one, like uh, title card chapters, and the subtitle, New and Selected, sort of implies that it is just like a selection of choices. Um, could you speak to that? And, and are these characters people who you think sort of would exist for you outside of this particular film? It was a way for me to understand it in a way. Going back to the structure uh, discussion, I think I thought of it in the writing like a like a collection of stories that an author may have. You know, they'd been published separately. You know, you'd see in the opening. You know, this one was in the Paris Review. This one was in, the, and that they were collected and put together. And you know, of course, I I designed it as a complete meal, as you say, um, uh, but that that was sort of, for me, the backstory of it. Um, uh, and so, I, yeah, I broke it up into sort of short stories was the idea. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I was thinking of authors who've returned to the same family over time. There was a John Updike collection that I read about the Maples family, and which I found very affecting. and, and the early stories were, you know, them when they're younger, and then they get married, and they have a family, and then later stories have them breaking up. And I, I, I found something ex extra moving about the fact that he that these stories existed in real time and weren't preordained, and that there was something very sad to me that he arrived at these conclusions for these people that he didn't necessarily have when he, you know, published the first story years before. Uh, and maybe because it's such a New York film. I mean, it's such an accurate New York film. Um, a Perfect Day for Banana Fish and the following Salinger stories. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the aisle. Hi, Noah. Uh, wonderful film. Thank you. I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the experience of working with Netflix and about this sort of, you know, still controversial but increasingly common way of, of putting a movie out into the world. Well, I made the movie independently, and I shot it on Super 16, and um, I designed it to be put into theaters as I make all my movies and, and, and expect all my movies 
to play that way. I mean, I think it's an unbeatable and I, I believe undying experience. And Netflix acquired it in post and they've been great. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think like many filmmakers, you know, this is the way you're supposed to see it. Yeah, on the aisle over here. Hi, um, I love the movie so much and I kept thinking children are so forgiving. And um, what was amazing to me was the different sort of level of parenting and kind of parenting. And it was so wonderful that Danny, who seems sees himself as a failure and everybody, is clearly has the closest relationship with his daughter. And it was so beautiful. And watching, um, um, I forgot the other name. Um, Matthew. Matthew try so hard with his five-year-old when they've both had such neglect or overemphasis or just crazy parenting like can you think of, can you talk about the parenting and how because it was so moving to me well yeah and, and I think sort of the, what I was saying before too about what how families kind of define their own notions of success I mean in that family it's clear what success means you know and um, uh, so anything short of it, I mean, Matthew makes money, but it feels like a failure because he's not an artist. Danny is, as you say, a wonderful parent, and you know, but because he failed as an artist, he feels like a failure. And that notion that being a great parent means you're a success is not, you know, it's just not valued in the family. And you know, I think these are things we all carry. To different degrees, we all carry these things out into the world and have to kind of contend with, you know, uh, you know, and 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 I think th this for them too, this idea of like, you know, trying to parent not like your parent or trying to. I mean, what's makes Danny, I think, a wonderful parent is that he parents, you know, f from himself. He's not like actually trying to correct what, you know, at least consciously, he doesn't seem to be doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's again, it's it's. I think of like art as religion in that way that it's above it's above everything for this family, and um, and being a good dad. If Harold, you know, the, the thing is, they they even give Harold the opportunity to be a good father, and he doesn't value it. He doesn't even value it enough to fake it. And um, you know, that's you know, I think. In some ways, Danny's success in the movie is is maybe owning that a little bit more. Yeah, there are two hands together, one in a blue shirt, and yes. On top of everything else, it's a wonderful looking film, and I wonder if you talk about the decision to use Super 16. Yeah, well, I had shot, I had shot um, Squid and the Whale in Super 16. And I, um, uh, in a kind of different way, though, I, we, we handheld the movie. It was a more, uh, for lack of a better way to define it, I guess more documentary, like less structured in, in terms of the blocking and everything. And I, it started with Francis. I shot on digital, but I shot it on the 5D, Canon 5D, and we shot it in black and white, and we really did a whole thing with that. And I was very happy with how that came out. Um, and then I tried the Alexa on a couple of movies, and I realized, in, and, I, and, and I felt it as soon as I started, as I went back into film, that you know, so much of the, 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 my making movies is connected to my childhood. It's not just the subject matter of, of, of the movies, it's also the, the, the going to movies, the seeing movies, and, and, and uh, you know, going back through that all the time. I mean, it's both conscious and unconscious. And watching something on film has a totally different emotional effect to me. And, and seeing it projected on film, which you didn't today, also has another f effect to me. And it's, I, I kind of realized having shot digitally that I, I need to do these things on film. And um, I had sort of tried to make an argument for digital just to sort of try it out. And I, um, it's fine, but it doesn't have the same meaning for me. 
Um, does uh, a 35 blow up of this exist? Well, th yeah, there will be a print of this, yeah. You don't have to blow it up the same way now because of the sort of digital process, but the, um, which we did on Squid, we blew it up, mm -hmm. you know, photographically. But yeah, there is a print. Yeah. Thank you for the film. Um, there is one scene when Matthews, uh, make, Matthew makes a reference to um, the Bruno accident with Harold, and he he's trying to make that reference because uh, uh, Danny is making an excuse for his limping, right? Uh, there are also several scenes when uh, Matthew tries to make references to other parts of the film, and I wanted to know uh, if you can talk about how you built this mythology of the family throughout the film the script. Well, it, it's, a, it's true. I wanted, I've been wanting for a long time to put in a movie somebody telling the same story more than once, and, uh, or the same joke more than once, and often it gets cut because it feels, it doesn't, I, I, haven't, I didn't figure out a way to give it extra meaning beyond the fact that you have to hear it again. And it's, it, it actually worked perfectly in this because that notion of, you know, things said to one kid and told again to the other kid, and then when the kids talk and, and kids kind of imitating their parents to each other, and, and it just, so all of those things gave me the opportunity to sort of repeat stuff that, you know, telling the same Sigourney Weaver story, telling, you know, the, that, um, and, and so I was able to, to have fun with that. And I think it's, you know, obviously it's common in families, you know, it's also common parents that they tell the same story over and over again. And, um, uh, and you know, if you have a character like Harold, you can get away with it a couple times more. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's something I, I enjoy doing and plotting out through the movie kind of when things would be repeated and who remembers what and who doesn't remember what and um, because they also it means different things to different kids too. Yeah, down here. Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk about how you changed from hard middle of the scene cuts to the fade outs at the end of the movie, the decision behind that. It was kind of an emotional decision. I mean, all, all the cutting off of people in the middle of what they're saying was in the script. And um, it was always designed that way to kind of, I, I, to, it was almost thinking of it as a version of an iris or a fade out or a dissolve. And then at the end, you know, again, I think because I sort of thought it, of it as like, I always thought of the end is almost like the short story that's actually written uh, is the new story put on the collection at the end? That was in my head. And that, that the author was maybe older and, and using a different, trying a different technique in a way. And uh, so not that I expect anybody else to know that, but I, it just felt right to me. I liked that. I liked those abrupt fades. I've seen movies um, in the past that have done that, that I always felt the kind of like it almost you know, you, it's like something goes into your throat or into your heart in a way. It's like, it's like, it's just envelops. And it was hard actually to do those fades. I, I had to, because digital fades just are all kind of uniform and we had to kind of find a way to recreate digitally what, you know, used to be an optical, you know, a, you know, a camera optical, uh, film optical. So, um, because it was very specific, the kind of fade I wanted, I didn't want it, it it's almost, I wanted it to kind of just like close out. And um, so that was the idea. But I also did them close to the action in the way that I cut off people, like so that you wouldn't hold with the scene and then it would fade. It would fade almost as the scene's still going, you know. Um, I mean, Kubrick does that great with dissolves, where the dissolves are continuing on into another scene while the scene, you, you can feel the other scene continuing on. And, um, so, uh, but it, in terms of the script, it was really an emotional, it just felt right to me. Yeah, we have time for one more. Just one, here, I see that hand. I know uh, 
Um, I have loved all your films and um, the dialogue in this film. I was struck at some points where the rhythm of the film had a screwball comedy kind of thing going for it and where the characters are talking so fast at cross purposes and not listening to each other. And it, it's funny, but it also packs an emotional wallop. And I wondered whether you, you that was, I mean, we see the awful truth, but that's for a different reason. But is there something of this screwball comedy in here? Yes, and, um, and it's something we did on Mistress America um, in, in a more kind of direct screwball comedy way in the second half of that movie. And I wanted to, to, to push that. I mean, the, the, the thing is, I, I, people ask me a lot if my movies are improvised at all, and I always take it as an insult because I think, come on, I'm working on these things. You know, I'm trying really hard. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to take it as a compliment because the, the dialogue is highly stylized, you know, and, and, and the blocking is highly stylized in the movie. I mean, it's all t very choreographed, the way of those comedies. And I'm interested in, in you know, because I, 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 you know, I love the energy of those movies. But I was also, I mean, but then I was watching like Max Opfel's movies with Robbie, who shot the movie beautifully with me. Um, and you know, with of course, has the great camera movement, and they're almost also, but they're they're not comedies, they're dramas, and but they're shot almost like comedies, and um, I was interested in that a lot too. So I, we were thinking a lot about that, of like you know, if you start them all, you know, Harold and Matthew and Gabe, and we're in the restaurant, and they're out of the restaurant, and then they come into the restaurant, and we take them all the way around to their seat, and the thing, that it would have the energy of a kind of His Girl Friday, even though there's this frustration, and there's all this other stuff going on as Ben is trying to get through this day. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of Lubitsch, I was thinking of Opfels, I was just thinking about, you know, pushing stuff I've been doing in other movies and seeing if I could go further with it and and how much can you push the stylization and keep it though in this realm of reality it's but it's not reality at all i mean the effect of the movie is an emotional true experience and a real experience in some way but it's if you break down the movie it's it's all living kind of above it you know um you know, I mean, I, I, like, you know, watching like scenes from a marriage again, I was thinking about that with that movie too, where it's totally crazy and heightened and, t t but it, it's, it's, you would say this, oh, this connects so, I connect so strongly with this. It so feels so true and real to me. And it's living in this theatrical world that's so, if you actually think of that, you know, and, and so I, you know, I, that's why I feel insulted when people sort of refer to things as sort of like documentary-like or improvised, and I think like, you know, I'm going for some total artifice here. Thank you so much. That was the answer to large. Thank you, large, yes, thank you, sorry.